Hello again, Saints. I want to thank everyone for tuning and watching in to another Thursday night Bible study where we are going over the doctrine of who God has called us to be in Christ as holy sons and holy daughters without blame in him. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at Ephesians survey. We're looking at the Ephesians survey, and this is lesson 10. Ephesians survey lesson 10. We're looking at that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And that before him in love is his selfless love. Holy before him, that we be holy before him in love. And again, as I said before, his selfless love, the Lord and Savior's selfless love. And all you have to do is go over to Romans chapter 8 when you see that, that when, when it says about God being for us, and, and, and that he, he he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And all you have to do is think about this here. When you're looking at that, with what, what the Lord says, what, what Paul is bringing forth through the Holy Ghost, that, that not only did God um, not spare his own son for us, for our success, but he delivered him up for our success as well. When you think about that and putting that into perspective, when you think about just say you 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 you're on the street somewhere and and you and your adult son are is there, and then you also have another person standing by the neighbor, and a speeding car comes by, and the speeding car comes by and it's, it's heading towards everyone, and you take the neighbor and push him out of the street first before your only son. How do you think that that neighbor would feel? How do you think he would he he would he would be indebted unto you? How would he feel that you sacrificed your own son for him? And but your intention was to choose him. And and and, and again, and I'm not saying that you wouldn't have chose your own son. I'm not saying that. But this guy would feel indebted to you. He would feel he would understand that your mercy and grace for him, what you did. And see, this is what when we look at God, our Savior, as is made mention many, many times, not just only Jesus Christ, our Savior, but God, our Savior and God, the Father. We're told to operate upon him, operate unto him in selfless love, not just, you know, I've seen someone say, um, well, we, God is our father that God's the father of every single saint, just every saint. And I'm not saying that there's no truth to that. But but what I'm saying is God wants to deal with us as sons and daughters. He wants to educate us. Hence, you see 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And if if we were all just if he was just a father to us all and, and, and whereas he can deal with us and receive us all there'd be no need for that verse to be used or what we're looking at right here and when and when he's presented and when he's being presented by paul as god our father we ought to pay attention wait a minute what is my father saying you know it's a difference between a person explaining that well if someone's going to educate you Oh, okay, that guy's going to educate you, or that guy's going to bring you up in the business, or this guy's going to show you how to how how to how to work, do the um, handle this craft, or he's going to educate you in the job. But when someone tells you your father is going to do it, you're going to say, "Wait a minute! Oh wow! Okay, now it puts it into perspective differently than just any person." And, and when we look at the titles given unto us. When it talks about God, our father, he wants to educate you as a son. And that's why we're, get, we're gearing all this up to the adoption of children that we're going to be looking at as well. That's where this is all heading at, folks, because the only way to understand the adoption of children, we have to understand a faithful saint, a faithful saint, but not just any faithful saint but a faithful saint that's getting educated by his father. 
And his father wants to educate him, not just as a faithful saint or servant, but as a son. That's the point. I hope we're getting this. And as I use the the uh, example about when someone sacrifices, when they make a sacrifice and they and, and they go and they would, would save the neighbor and then their son dies. That to put that into perspective of what the thinking of that person who just got saved, how his how his thinking ought to be. As I said before, he ought to be a debtor. As Romans 8.12 says, he ought to know that this guy made a sacrifice. I'm going to be a living sacrifice. I'm going to be a sacrifice for his sake. And he would. You know, it's the same thing with, with anything that's life or death. If someone needs a transplant and then you have someone say, hey, we're a match. And then someone say, wait a minute, you sure you want to give me your kidney your whatever don't you have 12 kids of your own maybe they might need one and the guy would say hey you know what you need it now if whether they need it later on that i don't know but you need it now and i'm going to give you give up of myself for you that's selflessness and again we we, we ought to handle we ought to understand that, that that this is what paul is laying out before us when we see these words, when we see that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, that's his selfless love. That, that's not just any old love that, you, that you've been taught by this world to love. That, that's, that's his selfless love that we are being taught. And let's, let's just get right into the verses. Come over to Ephesians chapter 1. Let's take a look at verse 3. Ephesians 1 verse 3. And let's look, yeah, verse, Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We went over this issue here. No need to go back over it again about showing the Father to Son relationship there. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, again, we looked at we looked at the idea that, that the purpose that he chose us for. And it, part of this, and what we're going to see, the purpose now is predestinating us unto the adoption of children. But the only way we can, the ones he desires to be predestinated unto the adoption of children are those who are holy and without blame before him in selfless love but god had a pre uh predestinated plan uh purpose that we be holy with, without blame before him in love and that we be predestined and he predestinated us and that we be uh, brought forth unto the adoption of children by jesus christ to himself but and let's just read that verse five having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Again, you see good pleasure. But we're going to get to verse 5 later. I, I just wanted to introduce it as a package, so to speak, that it is. It's actually all these verses are packaged together in, in a context of 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 understanding it ought to be you have in verse three and four you see verse two and three of course you see father to son and then again verse three father to son and our father too and the lord jesus christ's father has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in his own son as sons and then you see the uh, predestinated plan he chose us in him he chose not all saints but he chose that all saints would be this that they all would be holy and without blame before him in his selfless love and that's what we're going to be focusing our time on in chapter uh, verse four here and then next week we'll, we'll get into um uh 
verse 5, but and we've been predestinated, and I'm not going to, again, get into what the adoption of children is um, that's being spoken of here in this study, uh, nor will I get into the good pleasure of his will in this study and the idea of by Jesus Christ to himself in this study, but uh, we're just going to stick with what, we, what we're looking at here, and that, that is the idea that we should be holy and blameless and without blame before him in love. And, and earlier, I don't know whether it was the fourth lesson or the fifth, we looked at, we looked at when the sons of God came to present themselves um, before God, the angels, the angelic realm. And then we looked at also certain verses when it spoke of uh, Satan can speak reproachfully and, and, and um, who accuseth the brethren before our Lord day and night. And it, or we looked at, uh, we, um, we, we can make a show of them openly. And, and all these things to say and, and show that it is a before him. It is a, uh, a, a, an opportunity for us to put the doctrine and gospel on display. We can, we can actually bruise Satan's heel under our feet with the doctrine of the God of peace. It can be done, and we, we, we looked at those, those uh, verses there. That's where the battle comes to your front door, folks. That's where the battle comes to your front door as a soldier. You know, but it doesn't come to your front door if, if you the battle comes to your front door and you don't open the door. You, you don't actually open it with full armor on, but you open it. If you do open it, you, I don't want to say the word, get your wig blown back, but you, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll not be prepared. I just say it that way. <laughs> but the idea is that when we look at what God's word says to, unto us, we are to be prepared. We are, we've been given, as I've shown before in the other two video, prior videos, that he, we, he, we've been equipped. We've been equipped with the armor, as Paul's going to tell us at the end of Romans, at the end of Ephesians chapter 6, you're going to be shown that armor that you have. He's going to be laying out all the doctrine. He's going to be laying out, it's, it's as if Paul is saying, okay, here's the helmet in the chapter 1. Okay, here's the breastplate in chapter 2. Okay, chapter three. Here's the um, preparation of the. Uh, I mean, well, the the all the the the, the plates and everything else. He did the the the, the uh, buckler type shield and all them things. He he lays it all out. But then when he gets to chapter six, that's when he says, "Okay, now take every take all these mercies, take all these spiritual blessings that I told you about, and now." Put it on. Put on the whole armor. Everything yet, all chapter one through six up until this point here. Now put it on. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And that's where this is all going after. But let's move on. Come over to uh, First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter one. Yeah, First Corinthians chapter one. Let's take a look at verse uh, verse five. Verse 5, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Well, I'm going to just stop here. When you, when you, sometimes we just look over this when it says that in everything, not just everything, but everything, every single thing, ye are enriched by him. You know, when we look at the word enriched, um, if someone enriches my bank account <laughs> I'm gonna know I'm gonna desire to go look and see what they put in but I know it's gonna be more than I had before so this th what this is going after as well in everything would we be enriched not just enriched by you know the preacher or just some guy just anybody no him him that the one you know he works at perfection. If he works at perfection, if you're going to get anything, you're going to be enriched by him. It's got to be the best. It, it's got to be um, effectual. 
but as and you can see it's going to be in all utterance everything come out of your mouth and in all knowledge what you dwell upon what you come to understand your understanding but but that's where you to be enriched with and not physical blessings but inner man your inner man strengthened uh, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. You notice how he's saying, okay, well, you know, just as you've been justified, I want you to be that. Okay, now watch this. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what do you think that gift is? That gift is you be enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. That's a spiritual gift he's speaking of. He's speaking that you be strengthened in all utterance and all knowledge. That's the gift that's being bestowed. That's what's in the context here. Hey, this is not spiritual gifts. Uh, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, why do you, how do you think the blameless he's talking about here? What do you think that's about? This blameless is talking about being strengthened enriched in all utterance and in all knowledge that they and when they're when they are that and when they come unto that they will be blameless in the day and they could be blameless uh, uh, before they left this earth god is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son christ jesus our lord and god is faithful and, and many times we see that that being used, whether it's God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above, that you're able. And, and what that talks about, and over there, about if we deny him, but he abideth faithful and all these things, it's saying he's, he's true. His word is just. His word is right and righteous. And, and, and it is. And we're, we're going to see another one where it talks about faithful is he, faithful is he that called you, calleth you. We're going to see another one like that, but God is faithful in that in that you can count this to be true, his word to be true, him to be true, what he the provision he made for us out of his own word and his own mouth by the Holy Ghost, that we are called unto the fellowship of his son. And that fellowship of his son, what do you think that means? That's just not us. Be being a part of his body, that's also the, the end game is the fellowship of his son, brothers and sisters with the Lord. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when this says here, this is, of course, it's, it's talking about sanctification, the same thing that we just saw in 1 Corinthians was talking about. But sometimes people, when they look at both of those verses, because it says, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, or the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They think you're not going to be blameless and perfect until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ or until the day of his coming. And, and we're perfect because, oh, we're saved. And because we're in him, we're perfect. That's not what this is talking about. This is saying, when it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, who shall confirm you unto the end? Unto. That, that can be the, uh, a month from then unto the moment they leave this earth. A man can be blameless and perfect and holy while he walks the earth in Christ. And, and, and again, you're going to see that here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, and the very God of peace. Remember, the God of peace can bruise Satan under our feet. The very God of peace sanctify you holy, sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole, notice this, spirit, soul, and body. Don't we have that now? 
Are we going to take these bodies with us when we go to heavenly places? No. This is talking about now. Soul body be preserved, soul and body be preserved until unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not saying that when he comes, but it's from then, from now, up until that point. Don't be a demis. Be ones that's gonna not forsake the ministry and, and, and all these things. But look at um first Timothy now. First Timothy, and we're looking at the blameless issue here. And 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 and, and being faithful. And um well, no, 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 no. Let, let, let's come back to First Thessalonians. I didn't read the, the last verse here. It's good that I touch on what I touched on last time. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Do what? Do that. What, what was, what was uh, um, all mentioned there? Verse 23 on down. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And, and, and all these things. And that faithful is he that calleth you is the same faithful as he that we saw God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, of his dear son. This is what it's going after. His word can do it. And we got to trust in his word and we got to reckon it to be true. We have to count it to be true and understand faithful is he. We'll just say that justifieth himself and justifieth his word in us. If we, we who are called, if we, ex, I don't even want to say the word is accepted, but if we desire to be those. And as you're going to see, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, here's, it's speaking of one that is blameless, one that is faithful, or ought to be. And notice what, what his, um, how he gets this office. Verse 1. This is a true saying, if a, demand, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now, again, this is, the, this is and everyone will say, yeah, that's the qualifications of being, of being a preacher. And everyone will sign off on this and say amen. But then when it comes to actually understanding that a man can be, that we can be, a saint can be blameless today, sometimes we don't, we don't think that. And as I said, and I say it again, we hold the word perfect, the word blameless, the word uh, harmless, um, the word uh, faithful. We hold those words as a higher standing than God does. And I'm not saying that to say... Um, that God doesn't hold us in high, you know, hold us in high standings because, of course, we have his righteousness. But also we have his word wherein we can walk in his righteousness. We can be the sanctified and be sanctified holy, soul, body, and spirit. It, it, it can be our possession. We can be blameless. We can be perfect. We can be holy and, 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 and before him holy and blameless and faithful before him in his selfless love. And that's what I want to, and we'll spend the rest of the study looking at, because we looked at verses to show about being holy and faithful and blameless and, and things like that. But I just wanted to take a look at that a little bit there, you know, um, and deal with that. And then I want to kind of do a little introduction in a sense on, on verse 5, um, not get into the adoption of children so much first, but just the good pleasure of his will. Because if something's well-pleasing unto him, it would be that he has sons. It, what he asks for, what he's asking for is that we be holy and without blame before him in love. And that is well-pleasing unto the Father. And, and it's... It, it's something that I, got, I have to kind of walk this a little differently here. Like I did at the outset of the lessons, I had to first look at he's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ first, which is the verse 3 
And then I had to look at he's our father, which is verse two, you know, which some people say, well, why don't you look at verse two first? And, and, and again, here, uh, I have to look at it because, again, this is a package of a context, whereas God the Father, our Father, is also the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he has given us, who are who, who is his sons, all spiritual blessings. And he's also predestinated us unto something, but them who are holy and without blame before him in love, which is well pleasing unto him. So, but in love, in his selfless love, and that's why we have to, we're going to look at this a little differently, but I, I hope you're following. I hope I'm not leading you too far astray or taking you, taking you a, in a roundabout way where you're not, you're not understanding what I'm, what I'm trying to put together here. So without further ado, Let's get into the verses. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we'll just finish up here. Look at verse 10. And this is um, the last time we're going to look at blameless. I just want to look at it in, in the sense of the preacher and the bishop. Well, the bishop here and the deacon. And the main reason why, you know, I said we're going to go to the uh, good pleasure of his will thing, but... I want to touch more on this since we were already there that we would think that a faithful saint would be ones that are the preachers. You would think because he's the one that's going to be teaching um, the church, the body. So let's look at verse 10. Let's just get right into it. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. Let these also first be what? Proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Now, how is he going to be found blameless? Well, he's going to be proved. And uh, to be proved, you have to understand the, the you have to have the word of God dwelling richly within you. You have to be proved by his word. And look at verse 11. But but again, Office of a deacon being found blameless. And it, it, as I said before, being blameless in the sight of God is not the same in the sight of men. God looks, you can, you can start the proper doctrine and the proper education day one. It'd be, it'd be found blameless because you are only one day in of being blameless and thinking with a spiritual mind you can be too counted as blameless and faithful in all things as you grow on to him. Next day come, you're faithful in all things again. The next day, you're, you're blameless again. You, it, the next day, you're operating upon perf uh, being perfect. But look at um, uh, verse 11. Even so, their wives must be grave, not slanders, sober, faithful in all things. And as I said before, you know, when you... I did the study about the woman's functional salvation, and I have to go back and look. I think I, I think I did. Um, yeah, I did do do one on that. I don't think it was entitled that. It might have been um, uh, the attributes of the man and the woman after Satan. I think it's lesson six. I spoke of the woman, and I went over the, a little bit about the woman's salvation. And you notice in verse eleven here when it says, "So their wives must be grave." not slander, sober, faithful in all things. Every time it talks about the woman doing something, it always talks about what comes out of her mouth. It always talks about what comes out of her mouth and, and her, her sinning is either going to be what comes out of her mouth. That's why it says all verses about not permitted for them to speak and, and um, uh, let them the women be silent and, <coughs> excuse me, and all these things and tattlers and busybodies and and, and uh, all these and what you see here grave and we know grave what that means is peace peaceful when people die they put them in a grave and all these things but that's a different study but also she ought to be faithful in all things and look at uh titus <coughs> excuse me 
Titus chapter 1. Look at verse 6. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. You notice these qualifications also apply to the man's own household. Because if a man is going to have unruly children and, and un, unfaithful children, an unfaithful wife, he, he'll mess around and have an unfaithful um body of believers in the local assembly because you now you're dealing with adults now you're dealing with ones who aren't who don't even love you so to speak uh as a way uh, the, the the spouse would so uh, if you got the the wife starting out not blameless and the children not faithful then what you're going to get in that in, in the local assembly is the same thing but worse. Look at verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless, the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. Now, again, blameless. And again, what is it? Self-willed? He has to be selfless. That's the qualifications. Selfless. Now, now let's take a look at doing the good pleasure of his will. We're going to take a look at doing the good pleasure of his will and um, what is all, what is pleasing unto him. And then we're going to come back and look at uh, the issue that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Uh, I know you're like, wait a minute, are we looking at that now? Well, not so much, but the purpose is is that before him in love is is good ple is good pleasure to him it, it it's of his good pleasure that's why i want you to see it's of his good pleasure when we are walking in selfless love that's the point here so uh let's take a look at that doing the good pleasure of his will look at genesis chapter 1 genesis 1 verse 31 for time's sake let's just look at the one verse <clears throat> Genesis 1 verse 31 and God saw everything that he made and behold it was very good and that evening and morning were the sixth day now notice everything he had made that he had made that was the whole world that was creation that was all of creation and all creatures that creepeth and in the oceans and fly in the air and even us as well it's the sixth day now and it was all very good that's the that that's that's good that was good unto him everything was not in a fallen state look at uh romans 12 look at romans 12 look at verse 1. romans 12 verse 1 i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You don't think we can be holy unto him? Some don't think we can be a living sacrifice either, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, that's good unto God. That, that's acceptable unto him. It's perfect unto him. And our being not conformed to this world and our walking, being transformed by the renewing of our mind is good. And notice it's saying transforming is good and acceptable unto him. It didn't say you have to be transformed all the You have to be transformed before you can prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You can do it uh, um, while you are, while you are um, walking and live in a sanctified life, you can do that as well. And this is what, this is the will of God, even our sanctification, that we live unto him and we be holy and without blame. That is the, that's according to, that's the good pleasure of his will. It's well pleasing unto him. But I, I left out a part before him in love, in his love. If, if you have sons and daughters that are walking 
in your selfless love, in your the way you love, wouldn't that be well pleasing unto you? If they're operating, if you see your 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 your, your sons um, not only just shoveling your your snow for those that live in the cold area, but also you see them doing the neighbors also that they're volunteering just out of the kindness of their heart because they saw you do it before. They only had to see you do it one time. And then now they see someone across the street and they go shovel their snow. And and and, and they they do that. Don't ask, don't even you didn't ask for anything to do it, neither will they. That can be that's that could be to your good pleasure. That would be well pleasing unto you. That you that that they take on your selfless example. But let's move on. Let's move on. Come over to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 5, Colossians 1, verse 5. I'm going to try to get through the study of, try to keep it within one hour <laughs> this time, you know, I'm, I'm going to try. Colossians 1, verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And you know, Paul talks about that hope. And, and, and Ephesians chapter 1 goes over that hope too. And God is faithful in the hope that is given unto us. And it's laid up for us. And because, again, when we see this every time people see all these things about being faithful and um that we be holy and without blame, just because the word, uh, just because your vocation is mentioned, doesn't always mean that it's speaking that you can't be that now. But look at verse six, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringing forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard it and knew the grace of God and truth. Now, what, what fruit do you think that he's saying that came onto them and that they're, they're, they keep bringing forth fruit since the day they heard it. It's not saying in the day you heard it. It's since the day you heard it. it it's been something, it's a growing, a process of growing in doctrine and bringing forth fruit. Look at uh, verse 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, and, and, and he was, who also declare unto us your love in the spirit. That's their love, selfless love in the living word of God. And you know, when you see that word, your love in the spirit, this should, this should bring to remembrance and, and bring to your uh, uh, understanding that this is, uh, when it said, and without blame before, be holy and without blame before him in love, these saints were before the Lord in love, in so much Paul even knew about their love in the spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. See, it wasn't that they weren't operating upon knowledge of his will in wisdom and spiritual understanding. But Paul is saying that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and understand, spiritual understanding. Because there's, a, there's, a, there's something that he's trying to get across. And what that is, is that God's chosen us to be that to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Some might think we'll never know all the counsel of his will. You know, I had a person say that to me years back. We're going over the doctrine of um, the Lord's table, the uh, the issue with the bread and the cup. You know, and the person told me I'm using too many verses. And then in the next breath, they said, oh, we'll never know all the counsel of his will. You know, we had a three hour conversation pretty much only about what you know what they how long they've been in the ministry but 
instead of looking at all those verses that I was using, they said that we'll never know all the counsel of God. And I said, oh, well, look what Paul says here. Consider what I say. The Lord give thee understanding all things. And uh, I brought forth this verse, you know, and many others, Ephesians chapter 1, many, many verses to say that, it is the desire that we be, and we can be filled with all the knowledge of his will and, and, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Look at verse uh, 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto, notice this, all pleasing, being what? Fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is God's desire that we increase, that we keep increasing uh, in the knowledge of God not that you may be increased when you get when when the rapture come or you die know that we walk worthy unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work this is this is well pleasing unto him and that all pleasing is hit pleasing to his everything you see here is all is is all is well pleasing unto the Father, and what does it concern? It concerns our success, our being strengthened with His love, and with His knowledge, and His understanding. And notice what verse eleven says: "Strengthened with all might." If that wasn't good enough, strengthened with all might, according to the glorious accord. Well, let me just back up. Strengthen with all might. And that's not just any type of might or our might. It's, this is according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now, who would say that they're going to go through patience and long suffering with joyfulness? Anytime a person uses the word they got patience, it's because they're going through a trying situation where they have to show patience. And nine out of ten times, you're not, it's not joyful. If you're waiting somewhere, just say you're waiting at, at to get your driver's license, and it's always a long wait. It, people say, well, I'm being patient. But no one's being joyful about it. But this is again according, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. That's well pleasing unto him, that we be not just only just saints, but that we be faithful saints. And I was explaining this to some people before, well, yesterday, matter of fact, we were going over Zoom call and they wanted to, we were going over the issue about the difference between a faithful saint and, and a saint. And, and the difference between being an heir of God, being justified unto eternal life, and being a joint heir with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him that th this is not the same thing. But looking at what you see here, this is not talking about a saint that just gets justified today. He can't walk worthy unto the Lord, of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, he could increase in the knowledge of God, but he, he, he just got justified unto eternal life. He's in the house. He, he's, in a, he's in the great house. I'm not saying he's a vessel of dishonor, but he's not a vessel unto honor yet. But look at verse 12, because we're spending too much time on Oh boy. <laughs> Strengthen with all might according to the glorious, according to his glorious power, unto all patience, verse 11, and long suffering with joyfulness, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in, in light. We're going to get back to this next week. Because when you see this here, this kind of gives you a little definition, insight into the adoption of children. Hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And again, you've been made meet. And people say, wait, look at me. I'm, I'm still in this earthen vessel. Well, you've been, anytime you're being made meet, 
look at what this says. Every all those verses from now we'll just say verse six on down from the ones we're verse five on down. It all concerns you being made meat to be part of it, you being made. That's the word, but I'm trying to think of a word we use today. You've been made. I don't even want to use the word um, able. Um, qualified <laughs> to be partakers of the inheritance of the saint in life. But what makes you qualified is doing all those things, filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, walking worthy unto the Lord unto all, pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Hey, these are all things. And the, this is what the adoption of children Looking at the adoption of children, I don't want to even scratch the surface of it yet, but it, it, God's desiring that we, if we look upon not just an adoption of son, adoption of sons, but this is talking about adoption of children. This is this is this speaks to to his overall plan that he had that that he only just not just only just say. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, in that, being that, sons and daughters, and even over there in um, uh, Romans 8 and Galatians 4, when it talks about the adoption of sons, yeah, that's the plan, that's the plan, that, that's the, the calling, but also... There's an overall plan that God planned when he said he predestinated before the world and having predestinated us onto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. We, today, we, we, we can be as his sons. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ walked the earth as a faithful son and, 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 and the, the apostles too. But there is... An adoption of children that that he has that that we be we be partakers of that we that we fit into that he it's almost say for instance you know when a person has um you know an overall plan for their children and then they and and, and when they when they die they say okay well right now right now they they're training their kids up while they're living they're educating them, educating them as sons. And you got faithful sons living on to his father faithfully. But there's a time when the father's not going to be there anymore. And then now he knows he's going to say, here's the inheritance. Now you're off running and you, now you're on your own. And this is where this is leaning, leaning to. But I didn't want to use this sense of like, as in we're not going to we're going to be off on our own. And this is without God. And, and don't take it as that. But it's the overall plan and purpose where you can, it's all fully come into purpose, come into fruition. And when you see that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together and want all things in Christ, both in heaven and, the, and, and in the earth. It's not saying that the adoption of children is going to, be is going to take place. Uh, you're waiting on that till you get there. As you see here, it talks about, what you've been you've been made meet you're part of it already and another verses is verse uh chapter two have raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in christ jesus we're here now we can fulfill we're fulfilling that now but let's uh let's move on come over to um first thessalonians first thessalonians chapter three And maybe we could get into this. We can get keep it in a in a good time time frame. Uh, look at verse chapter three, verse seven. Uh, we're looking at again that we should be holy and without blame before before is what I'm after here. Him in love before him in love. Therefore, brethren, we are we we are comforted over you in all our afflictions and distresses distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. 
Notice what he's saying. He's comforted over them in all their, in, in all Paul's affliction and distresses by their faith. See, Paul is looking upon what they're going through. And he's and he's comforted when he gets afflicted. He's he can look back and say, Man, I'm getting I'm getting afflicted, but but look at those, but look at the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians are are, are are strong in the faith and, and they're they're being afflicted unto death. And and who am I to try to who who am I to want to faint? Well, who am I to want to give throw in the towel? And you see these these saints over here operating upon the word of God, allowing it to work effectually within them. That gave that gives Paul comfort. And uh, then he says, "For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord." Paul saying, "Now I can." Is you guys are standing fast in the Lord? I can live. I I can. Um, uh, walk in comfort and I can be uh, I can live in that consolation by your faith look at verse 9 for what thanks can we render to God again for you for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God you notice all this joy going on here in these verses and he talked about affliction and distresses but he says, for what thanks we can render to God again for you? He's give. He's like, how much more thanks can we render to God? How much more thanks can we can we give unto Him because of your faith? And we joy in uh, for your sakes before before our God. Now, what is why does Paul say before our God? In the sight of God, before Him. Is what he's is what and God and what he's saying is God knows our heart. God can see our heart. It's well pleasing to him that that we that we um we're comforted in 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 our afflictions by your faith. Your faith is is strong, so strong that we can joy before God in you. But notice this, verse 10. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking lacking in your faith. Now, hmm, he's talking about, you see what he said about them, how much they've helped him spiritually. And he's saying that he might perfect that which is lacking uh, in their faith. Remember, this is one of the first epistles written. They're going to get more epistles, but they're already operating upon faithfulness and perfecting, per perfectness. They're, they're perfect, but he's going to give them more. And, and he's going to even say in chapter two, I mean, in uh, the second epistle, that they did abound yet more and more. As I said before, it's a, it, it's a day by day perfecting, blameless, uh, all these things. Look at verse 11. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Notice the, um, the example here. You see how we treat you in love, I want you to do the same thing and increase. He already said they were, uh, uh, you are taught uh, of God, brotherly love. There's, in other words, he, say, he said that you are taught of God how to love each other already. And he's saying, well, you're taught of God how to love, walk in it. And, and so you see here, look at verse, look at the next verse. That's what I'm after. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. And see, people see that there, and they say, oh, we're only going to be unblameable in holiness, uh, operate upon holiness. That's only going to be 
um, uh, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, that's, it says to the end, to the end, not at the end. He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Lord, even our Father. Notice, our, even our Father, not just God, but Father to Son relationship. And, but that's what he wants to do, establish our hearts before him in love, selfless love. But notice who's doing it. Who's the one establishing it? It's the same thing, what you saw over there in Romans 16. Romans 16, what did it say? Now to him that is of power to establish you. Notice again, to the end, he may establish your hearts. God is establishing our hearts. And he's establishing it after his own heart, after his son's heart. Unblameable in holiness before God. That's what he desires. Now come over to uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And we're just going to look at the verse at hand for time's sake. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. I charge thee before God and the elect and Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Now, before I get to before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, notice he says that thou observe these things without preferring one before another. That's selfless. That's that's you, you got you, not to have favorites. That's operated upon selfless love. But he's charging before God that they walk before Him in love. That's walking hold. That's walking holy and without blame before Him in love. Because you you wouldn't be blamed by by others if you was walking if you was preferring one over the other. You could be blamed. And that's not in love. That's only love for one or love for one or another. That's not love for all, as this is saying. And that's why it says before God, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. You notice all three are there watching. It's before them. The, the, the Satan can speak reproachfully. How can he speak reproachfully? How does he know? How could he see? How could he tell? How could the angels, how could we be made a spectacle unto the angels? How could they know? How could they see? How could they tell what we're doing? Why would Paul always say before uh, peace from God our Father and from Lord Jesus Christ and, and all these things and, and before him and all these things? Because they know, they can see that we're being put on display here. And before him in love, his selfless love. And again, as I said, um, when you see First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, when it says, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable with and and and, and it before him in love. It's it is God that is educating us, but not just educating us as God, but God the Father. That's the point here. That's the point, and I wanted to end it on that, but we're not done yet, but I wanted you to understand that it is a father to son training sons in his love to operate upon it, but before him. It's almost as if you, you, you train your kid to how to play a particular sport. Just say you yourself were, were a great athlete and you just say you were a professional player of anything. We'll just say hockey. And you train, you train that child up and you train them and you were one of the best yourself. Now you train them up and now you, you, uh, they're out there and you're, you're at their games and they're operating upon it, which is well pleasing. And they're, they're, they take what you've taught them could be well pleasing unto you. It's but now it's before you what they're operating that you taught them. You can see the benefit. You can sit back and it's all pleasing. It's well pleasing. And that's what uh he's been going after. 
here in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1. But what we do, let, let, let's move on. Um, and that way, how we can be holy and without blame before him in love. Let's, let's look at that and we'll close. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I know we were just in 1 Thessalonians there, but, you know, we skipped back by. But let's just go back to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, let's look at chapter 4 now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as ye have received us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Paul's asking them that they abound more and more. And when you go to second chapter, second epistle, you'll see that they did abound more and more. But again, Paul said they received of them how they ought to walk and to please God and that they will abound more and more. But what do you think would be well-pleasing to God? All the verses that we looked at, strengthen with all might, uh, full of understanding, his understanding in all wisdom and understanding. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power, that they would be holy without blame before him in love. That's well pleasing. Look at verse two. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And those are commandments. You know, they don't have to follow them. Israel didn't follow all the commandments. I'm not saying that, that they shouldn't. Yeah, of course they should. But I'm saying that these commandments aren't saying if you don't follow these commandments, you're going to hell. That That's not what I'm after. God desires that we follow these commandments. Look at verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. And that ain't all that that, that it is. But this is what was troubling them. That This is what was troubling these saints. It's not saying that uh, you can do everything else, but just don't do this. That was what they were dealing with. Um, but notice, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, and the will of God is that they would walk, as verse 1 says, uh, know how to walk and please God and abound more and more. Uh, verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. And, and, and that should be self-explanatory. Now come down to verse 7, verse 7 now. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto what? Holiness. This is what we're after. God has called us to be holy unto him. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And they are. It, notice brotherly love, God operate upon his selfless love before him in love. His selfless love gives up of itself, and ours ought to as well. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Now, yeah, it's toward all the brethren in Macedonia, but what about the other brethren? What about other others? And they are, he desires that they increase in selfless love more and more. Come now, come over to verse chapter 5 now. Chapter 5, look at verse 21. Prove all things, hold fast that which is what? Good. And when they're going to prove all things, they're proving it based upon those verses that we just looked at. They're going to be using, they're going to have all spiritual understanding, all wisdom. That's how they're going to prove everything, every single thing. They're going to look at it with a spiritual glasses on. They're going to have spiritual word of God glasses on they're going to have. And it says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good in his sight. Oh, whatever God says is good, the good of God, hold fast to that. Don't allow yourself to be led or um, whatever. That's why it says in verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. 
If it looks like it's evil, don't do it. Don't go that way. Don't walk that path. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole soul, I mean, whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, we looked at this before. The very God of peace it, it, it preserve you. Look at faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. And again, I came back to here because last time we didn't look. We didn't look at verse 21, but we did it now. So now come over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at verse 11 and we'll close. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our, of our, um, well, let, let's just read that again. Okay. Ah, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ be, may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. There we go. <laughs> but again, notice the, uh, that you, it, God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness. Fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness. That's fulfill all the good pleasure of all his goodness and the work of faith with power. You know, that takes that takes a well-pleasing. And it says... Now, this is the good pleasure of his goodness. His, whatever, in other words, his goodness is going to be, should be going through or operating upon you. And that will be his good pleasure because it's his goodness given to you with power that you ought to be operating upon. And that can be done before him in love, folks. But we have to operate upon our father's love. And we'll probably touch a little bit on his love. Uh, well, all of this is his love. But when we get to next week about predestinate us unto the adoption of children, we're going to touch back to his uh, uh, being before him, how his love would uh, is, is centered for us in him predestinating us unto the adoption of children and how we ought to operate upon his selfless love um, to what degree this is that we know what's at stake here, that we know that uh, why there is a adoption of children being brought forth there. But, oh, man, what we're doing, and I look at the time because we're going over again there. And, uh, you know, and, and again, and looking at and looking at this here, it's something that we, we we should know that we we've come to understand how we we lived on to him as sons, faithful sons, faithful daughters, and understanding that what his desire is all about, and it all concerns our success as children, adoption of children there, at the adoption of sons, and that we ought to understand his understanding about that. And, and, and maybe if we understand what's at stake and the significance of us being sons and the significance of him predestinating us onto the adoption of children, maybe we'll say, you know what? Now I can see. Now, now I want that. I, I, I desire to cry out of a father. That's, that's my hope. But I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Until next time, thank you.